In today's video, we'll have a brief overview of how network applications work. Let's get started. Today in our computer networking class, we're starting on Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is all about the application layer. In this video, we'll look at general principles of network applications, and in future videos, we'll look at a number of common network applications, including web, email, the DNS system, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and video streaming. And then the chapter wraps up with some information about socket programming so you can design your own networked applications. It is important for us to understand the concepts behind networking in order to understand how to make the best use of it in our applications. Part of this includes understanding what services are provided by the transport layer. The transport layer is discussed in chapter three, so those details will come later, but a number of times throughout this chapter, we'll have forward pointers that say, and then the application interacts with the transport layer and some magic happens that we'll discuss later on. Several of the applications that I mentioned on the last slide also have application layer protocols that are specific to those applications. So in chapter two, we'll be discussing both applications and application layer protocols. I know we're all familiar with many network applications, and this slide just mentions a few popular ones. One important thing to keep in mind as we go forward is that different applications have different service requirements from the network. So while they all need connectivity, web may be functional with a level of network service that isn't suitable for voice over IP. And likewise, voice over IP may work with a level of service that's not suitable for streaming video. So understanding these requirements will also help us as we go forward and look at the lower layers of the network and the services that they provide. In creating network applications, it involves running software that will run on multiple devices around the network. One of the advantages of the network architecture is that because the core of the network only handles the lower layers, the core devices do not have to be modified in order for a new application to work over the network. This is one of the benefits of the layered architecture. Most of the networked applications we use follow the client-server paradigm. The server side of the application is typically always on and listening for connections. In order to be reachable, it may have a fixed IP address that does not change over time. And for scalability reasons, the server itself may be located in a data center. Neither of these things has a requirement, however. The server application is just one that listens for incoming connections. The client applications, on the other hand, are the ones that reach out and contact servers. So the client may not run all the time, it just establishes a connection when it's started. Because it doesn't need to accept incoming connections, a client will be minimally impacted if its IP address has changed over time. Client software, however, doesn't directly contact other clients. It only contacts server applications. Typical examples of the client-server paradigm include web browsing, email, and streaming video. In a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, we don't have this concept of an always-on server, and peers communicate directly with one another. Another way of thinking about this is that a peer acts both as a client as a server. It can reach out to other peers to establish connections, and it will listen for incoming connections from other peers as well. As the set of peers grows, each peer adds new service capacity to the network. It's common that peers have to deal with changing IP addresses, which adds complexity to managing a peer-to-peer -peer network. Processes are the individual programs that run on a host and follow the same client-server model. An individual client process may communicate with a server process either on the same host or over the network on a different host. The peer-to-peer -peer applications we just mentioned run both types of processes, so they'll include both a server and a client process. In order to make this communication happen between processes, they interact with the Sockets API. The Socket API is something exposed by the operating system that allows processes to send messages to one another. The layers that are below the socket are implemented in the operating system, whereas the application process runs in user space. For each communication instance, two sockets are involved, one on the sending side and one on the receiving side. In order for a process to be able to receive messages, it must have some identifier so that the operating system knows which process a particular message should be delivered to. This is different from the IP address of the host. The IP address is able to differentiate one host from another by having different IP addresses. However, the processes within one host all have to communicate over the host's IP address, which means they need an additional identifier to differentiate between processes. At any given time, there will be tens or hundreds of processes running on a single host, and so they need a robust address space for this identifier. The identifier used for processes is the port number. By combining a port number and an IP address, we then have a unique identifier that gets us all the way to a specific process on a specific host. Some commonly used port numbers you may recognize include port 80 for HTTP traffic and port 25 for an email server. Port numbers are also broken down by transport protocol. So port 80 on TCP is a different port than port 80 on UDP. We'll discuss port numbers in more detail when we get to the transport layer. 
An application layer protocol, such as HTTP, defines a number of things. These will include the different types of messages that are valid, the syntax of each of those messages, what actions should be taken when a message is received or after it is sent, and the specifics of the information contained in each field of the message. Many application protocols are open and specified in RFCs, just like other layers of the network stack. This allows many different developers to create applications and processes that utilize that application protocol. On the other hand, there are also proprietary protocols that only work within a certain developer's application. The open protocols tend to be more broadly used because competition among developers tends to improve applications and result in more end users that rely on that particular application protocol. Now we'll look at just a little bit of information about what transport services the application may need from the layers below. One important service is data integrity. Some applications expect that the data that is sent on one end will come out exactly correct and in order on the other end. This is what we call 100% reliable data transfer. Other applications are loss tolerant, so they may be able to accept some corrupted data or lost data in the transfer process. Another service that some applications need is low latency. For example, voice over IP, i.e. internet telephony, or interactive online games are examples of ones that have tight latency requirements. Other applications are less concerned with latency than they are with throughput. For example, a streaming video, if it doesn't have sufficient throughput, will continuously stop and rebuffer and may be unusable for the viewer. Other applications are elastic, such as a file download, which may take longer with low throughput, but can still complete correctly. Last but not least is the issue of security. Some applications may expect either a data integrity or confidentiality service from the layer below. So with those services in mind, we can look at our common applications and see what categories they fall into. For example, the file download that I just mentioned is relatively elastic on throughput. It does not have a tight latency bound. However, it cannot accept any loss. It's expected that the file that is received will be exactly correct bit for bit to the one that was sent. Email has similar service requirements, whereas real-time audio and video are considerably different. They are generally loss tolerant. Loss manifests as a small amount of corruption, either in the audio or the video, but generally, the user will not notice this as long as the loss rate isn't too high. On the other hand, they do have minimum bandwidth requirements in order to deliver a usable service. Likewise, they have a latency requirement beyond which users will notice that they are not interacting in real time anymore, but there's a delay between the other person speaking and being heard. Streaming audio and video, on the other hand, is something that was recorded in the past, so it doesn't have this tight latency requirement, but may have a similar minimum throughput requirement. Applications like email and text messaging are interesting in that, yes, there is a time constraint, but it's not nearly as tight as something like real-time audio. Meaning, if I send a text message or I send an email and it arrives in 30 seconds, I probably am not aware of that delay, nor is the recipient. However, if these messages were to arrive hours later or days later, I would probably start to notice and not be satisfied with this service. So with those in mind, Let's see what the transport layer actually offers in terms of services. Almost all network traffic uses one of two transport protocols, either TCP or UDP. The service offered by TCP is the 100% reliable in-order delivery service that we mentioned a few slides back. Whereas the UDP service makes essentially no guarantees on top of what the underlying network layer offers. In addition to reliability, TCP offers flow control, congestion control, and a connection-oriented setup process. It does not, however, offer any sort of latency guarantee or bandwidth guarantee. So with those two alternatives, why does UDP even exist? Well, when we get to discussing the transport layers, we'll see what the compromises are involved in offering these services by TCP. There are trade-offs involved that some applications may not want to accept. So here's how those applications we mentioned a couple slides ago map onto the transport protocols. It is interesting to note that almost all of them map onto TCP. The few listed here that use UDP also use TCP in some form. The one exception, which is not listed here, is the domain name service, which primarily uses UDP as its default protocol. But even that has a mode where it can operate over TCP. We also mentioned that some applications may want a security service. The base behavior of UDP and TCP offers no security. All of the fields, including the headers and the content, may be seen by any device along the path. However, there is a protocol called TLS, Transport Layer Security, which offers encrypted TCP connections. This allows applications to create a socket 
that sends data encrypted over the network without every application developer having to roll their own security and encryption protocols. The TLS layer ends up being a shim in between the application and the TCP layer, which is still used underneath. That wraps up our overview of applications. In our next video, we'll look in much more detail at web applications and the HTTP protocol specifically. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell. Thank you.